A quick disclaimer, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not recommend or endorse any healthcare providers or treatment. The use of information presented on this podcast is at the listener's own risk. Please do your own research. This is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you're ill, do not delay seeking advice from your doctor. And finally, the views expressed by the hosts of this podcast do not represent the views of any official organization, hospital, or institution. Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast, where we explore ideas currently on the outskirts of medicine. I am your host, Daniel Belkin, and I am here with my co-host, Mitch Belkin. Thank you, Daniel. We are both medical students. I am at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and Mitch is at the esteemed University of Maryland School of Medicine. How's it going, Mitch? Well, Daniel, starting this week, we are going to be sending out regular updates to our subscribers. So if that sounds exciting to you, then go over to externalmedicinepodcast.com forward slash subscribe to join the listserv. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover or can we just get into it? Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's all let's right. get let's get into some Paul Offit. All right. Today our guest is Dr. Paul Offit, a pediatrician at the University of Pennsylvania, specializing in infectious diseases, vaccines, immunology, and virology. He is the co-inventor of the Rotatech vaccine for rotavirus, has published more than 130 papers in medical and scientific journals, and he is the author or co-author of books on vaccines, vaccination, and antibiotics. This interview was recorded on April 5th, 2021. In the interview, we talk with Dr. Offit about mRNA vaccine technology, as well as a number of other topics from his book, Overkill, When Modern Medicine Goes Too Far. Some of these topics include the use of antipyretics to treat fever, the overuse of antibiotics, vitamin D and vitamin C supplementation, and cancer screenings. Just a note, we had some minor audio problems during the first part of this interview, so for that, we apologize. And now, we bring you Dr. Paul Offit. We're here with Dr. Paul Offit. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking me. So let's start off. And before we get going, could you please tell us if you have any financial disclosures to make? I am a Philadelphia Eagles season ticket holder, which renders me incapable of viewing that that team team objectively. (laughs) Okay. Well, Paul, so you... You've done a lot of different things. How do you describe to people what it is that you do? Um, I, I think at the heart of what I do is child advocacy. I think I, I after graduating from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, I was um, drawn to pediatrics, I think because of just an interest in children and children's health. And, and that sort of, you know, I, thinking I would be a general pediatrician, then I kind of um, got interested in research, which surprised me since I really hadn't done basic science research, either as a undergraduate or a medical student, but I just loved the process. And then, you know, sort of launched this 26 year effort to work on rotaviruses, which you know, I was fortunate enough to be part of the team at Children's Hospital Philadelphia that created the rotavirus vaccine. I mean, because I saw a child die of rotavirus when I was a resident and, you know, that image always stuck with me. So I saw this as a, another expression of sort of child advocacy in many ways. And then, you know, with watching the sort of the rise of the anti-vaccine movement, when I was a voting member of the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, we founded the uh, the Vaccine Education Center at CHOP, and I wrote a series, have written a series of medical narratives, I think all in, in the name of kind of generally protecting children from harm. I think that's what it's all about. All that it came from being a child where I was in a polio ward when I was a child, then Kernan's Children's Hospital, which is in Baltimore. Um, then I think it was called Kernan's Hospital for Crippled Children, when you could use words like crippled and feeble-minded in the name of your hospital title. Um, but I think it was the back, back in the days, so there was one visiting hour a week, you know, Sundays from two to three, and um, it was grim. I mean, it was Dickensian, you know, the, that. And I think that sort of drove me to pediatrics. I think it drove me to a love of children. I, you know, I guess we, we all... Uh, you know, I, I think the, the uh, passions of our adulthood are invariably a result of the scars of our youth. And I think that was 
score a scoring event for me. And you still practice, correct? I still see patients. Yeah, I mean, in patients in the division of infectious diseases at Children's Hospital. That's right. And what what exactly is your role with regards to the FDA and approving vaccines? All right, so I'm a voting member of the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. So the whether Pfizer, Moderna's vaccine or Johnson & Johnson vaccines, those vaccines came through our committee for a vote. Um, and then we make a recommendation to the FDA for to whether to approve or not approve. So a lot of people are following vaccines in a way that they've never followed vaccines before over the last year. Can you talk a little bit about the mRNA technology that was put into uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? What is exciting and new about this technology? Right, so technically it's not new. It's not a new technology in the sense that, you know, people have been working on it for 20 years. The, the seminal publication, which actually came out of the University of Pennsylvania by Drew Weissman and uh, Catalin Carrico in Molecular Therapeutics in 2008, was a major advance because what they showed they could do with this messenger RNA, this small piece of genetic material, that when it enters the cell, um, then, you know, goes into the cytoplasm, is taken into the ribosomal system, where it's then translated to a protein. Um, the problem was um, using messenger RNA that was un, un, uh, unmodified was that it breaks down very quickly. So they stabilize that molecule. And the other thing they did is messenger RNA is an adjuvant. It stimulates the innate immune system through uh, proteins like interleukin-3, interleukin-7, interleukin-8. They made it so it didn't do that, which made it then a little easier to use as a vaccine. But this is a product, this is a, a technology which can be used for cancer therapy. You can sort of, tar you know, you can make a, a, a cell more targetable with, say, cytotoxic T cells. It can be obviously has an extension for gene therapy and now vaccines. Um, it's, it's a major advance. I, I can't, can't begin to tell you how surprising this year has been. I mean, think about this for a second. You have, in January 2020, you have a publication in Science that is, and, and The Lancet, that is the sequence of this virus. Okay, so now you know the sequence. Within 11 months, you had two vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the, the Moderna vaccine, that showed they were 95% effective against all manner of illness. Now we know also effective against preventing asymptomatic infection, effective in people over 65, as effective in people over 65, as effective in people with a variety of comorbidities, was, was safe when put into tens of thousands of people, and now has been shown not even to have a rare side effect when in, in more than 100 million people. I mean, this is as close to a perfect vaccine as you could ever ask for. If you remember back in the, in the summer, last summer, Dr. Fauci said, you know, that, that they would accept 50% effectiveness and they would be happy with 70%. It's 95% effective. And I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop because this is an elusive virus. This is a, a virus that's had a lot of surprises in terms of clinical characteristics and pathological changes. And you're meeting that with a technology that has never been used commercially before. You, can, you assume something is going to happen. And it hasn't. It's, it's just amazing. And when you say 95% effective, you're saying 95% effective against someone getting infected with coronavirus. It's actually 100% effective against or nearly 100% effective against uh, hospitalization and death. Is that correct? That's right. I want to jump back. You were talking about the mRNA technology and the actual stability that the design of this has. Can you, can you speak just for a minute about how the mRNA molecule is stabilized? Yeah, so it uses these sort of uh, like pseudouridine, for example, these nucleoside analogs that are not the actual nucleoside, but are an analog of the nucleoside that make it more stable. So like pseudouridine instead of uridine. And, and that's that's was how they were able to remember if you're if you're just inoculated with mRNA period in your body you have RNA aces throughout your body you'll just break it down so that that's pre prevented by putting it in a lipid nanoparticle but in addition when it gets into the um, into the cytoplasm it has a longer life than it might otherwise because of those uh, modifications and you also mentioned previously that this is the first time that although this is uh, this mRNA technology has been developed for a while. It's the first time that it's been commercially used and already is in been administered to over 100 million people. There are still some people who are concerned about adverse events. What would you say to them about the safety profile of mRNA technology? Right. I think that when this vaccine first was introduced, it, the, the language that surrounded it was a little scary, right? Operation Warp Speed. Um, 
you know, the race for the vaccine, who's going to be the first to cross the finish line? It's scary. And, and if you, you know, when they asked people back in September, would you get a COVID-19 vaccine, which is basically another way of saying, would you get a theoretical COVID-19 vaccine? Because there was no vaccine at that time. About 70% of people said they wouldn't. And that surprised people. Although if you'd asked me that question in September, I would have said not till I see the data, right? I mean, I'm not going to take a theoretical vaccine. But then December rolled around and there, there, was, there was more data. Now you had data on safety and efficacy. Now you have the, the most recent CDC report, now that the vaccine has been out there for a few months, that it's as effective as it was efficacious. In other words, when you do studies in, um, in phase three trials, those are done under highly controlled conditions. You know that those people that are doing the trials at the site know how to, how to, how to handle that, that product, um, know how to store that product, know how long they, they can keep it in the refrigerator, you know, because for Pfizer's vaccine, it you know, has to be shipped and stored on dry ice. It's only got a five-day life in the refrigerator. Once you violate that rubber stopper on the multi-dose file, you have six hours to give that vaccine. You know that during those trials, that's all going to be done right. But then when it goes into the real world, is it going to be as effective? And now we know, yes, it's as effective as it was efficacious in those trials. So, so that's good. And, you know, if somebody had come to me and said, said look, I, I see that you've done, you know, given 20,000 people Pfizer's vaccine, you've given 15,000 people Moderna's vaccine. So now we know that this, this novel product doesn't have a, at least an uncommon side effect. I want to wait until this vaccine is in a few million people. I think I, you know, because I'm not helpless, right? I can still wear a mask. I can still physically distance. I can still find other ways to avoid this. I want to wait to see whether it doesn't have a rare serious side effect. I'm a young person. I, you know, I don't think I'm going to die from this. I think that would have been a reasonable thing to say. But now, I mean, Maurice Hillman, the father of modern vaccine, said it best, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. Fair enough. Now, more than 100 million doses are out there, and it doesn't even cause a rare side effect. It's, while it's reasonable to be skeptical, I don't think it's reasonable to be skeptical anymore. I think skepticism should melt away at this point. If people are still saying they don't want to get the vaccine, it's not because they're skeptical, it's because they're cynical. They don't believe the data that they're being shown. Do you have an opinion on the first doses first campaign? I know some economists have been supporting it and it's actually what Britain is doing, I believe. If listeners aren't aware, it's basically giving people the first dose of the two dose vaccine up front in order to vaccinate more people and then putting off the second dose. Uh, do you have an opinion on that at all? Yes, I have a strong opinion on that. This is a two dose vaccine. And I think what happens when you when you disrupt an immunization program, which is what's happened, I think, both here and in the United Kingdom, where we say, you know, hey, look, one dose, 80 percent efficacy, two doses, 90 percent efficacy, you know, for, for several weeks. But, you know, if you look at the data, the phase one data on both these vaccines, the second dose induces a tighter or level of virus specific neutralizing antibodies that is tenfold greater than the first dose after the first dose. Secondly, and most importantly, you only detect clear evidence of cellular immunity, meaning T helper cell responses, cytotoxic T cells, which predict more durable immunity after that second dose. So I think what happens is you now have a lot of people who've gotten one dose who think, you know, 80% of one dose, 90% of two doses is close enough, not realizing that they're less likely to have durable immunity. And also, very importantly, less likely to have protection against these variants. It's those T helper cell responses that are more broadly cross-reactive that will give you at least the kind of immunity against variants that'll keep you out of the hospital and keep you out of the morgue. And I worry that, that, that people aren't going to come back for that second dose. It's a two-dose vaccine. Dr. Fauci has been clear on this, and there have been a number of pundits on national television who have been pushing for this one-dose strategy, and I think it's wholly irresponsible. Where do you see, like, what do you see the future of coronavirus in the human population? Do you think that this is going to be a seasonal thing? Do you think after enough people get the vaccine, it's going to go away? Uh, is, are we going to have to get boosters every year or every couple of years? What, what do you think? This vaccine, this virus will be with us for a long time. That's, I can say without, without equivocation, it's a mucosal virus. While you can slow and reduce the spread of mucosal viruses, generally you don't eliminate them. I mean, you can eliminate measles because it has a long incubation period. Viremia is an important part of pathogenesis. You can eliminate that kind of virus. So you can eliminate measles, which you did by the year two. 2000, even though that virus is 10 times more contagious than, than SARS-CoV-2. You can eliminate rubella for the same reason as we did by the year 2005. You'll never eliminate this virus. I, I think what you can hope to do reasonably is to control it. 
um, you're not going to eliminate any more than you could eliminate influenza or respiratory sensitive virus or rotavirus. I mean, rotavirus also is a mucosal virus. So they, they, these viruses have short incubation periods generally. Um, the viremia is not a part of pathogenesis. So when we talk about herd immunity here, what we're really talking about is critically reducing the spread of this virus. Um, so it's going to be with us forever. In terms of how long immunity will last from vaccination or natural infection, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think it would last for a few years. But because you do seem to induce fairly high titers of memory B and T cells, which usually presages um, longer term uh, immunity, but um, not decades. And, and the, the need for a second dose would be, or, or booster dose, would be either two reasons, either one, because immunity fades. And so you need to give a second dose or third dose or fourth dose of the same vaccine. The other reason would be if a variant becomes completely resistant to um, immunity induced by natural infection or immunization. In which case, and by completely resistant, I mean, even though you've been naturally infected or you've been vaxxed, fully vaccinated, you still are hospitalized or killed by this virus. Then you're talking about a second generation vaccine. That's not a booster dose. That would be another vaccine. Do you have an opinion on the use of Tylenol or ibuprofen uh, before or after the vaccine? I definitely have an opinion about before. Um, there are two studies, one in Australia, the other in Czech Republic, looking at uh, people who, who pre-treat, if you will, um, primarily children who get a flu vaccine or a variety of pediatric vaccines, and you lessen the immune response. So don't pre-treat. That's easy. Um, in terms of treating, there really aren't data on that. But I would say um, if you can gut it out, you should. I mean, I got my second dose of mRNA-containing vaccine, and for two days I had fever, including reasonably high fever and fatigue, which I treated successfully by constant whining. Okay, so I'm giving this to your <laughs> listeners. Um, work like your are gone in two days. So now we want to shift over and talk about your book. You wrote a, a great book, which came out last year. It's called Overkill. Can you tell us a little bit about your creative process and what prompted you to write the book? Right. So the subtitle is When Modern Medicine Goes Too Far. It's, it's basically a, um, a look at whether or not there are situations in modern medicine where we do things, even though there's abundant scientific evidence that says we shouldn't be doing that. I can tell you what the genesis of this book is. The genesis of this book was the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I mean, Ted Woodward and John Diaconis and Ellen Wall were all there when I was there. They were all what I would affectionately call skeptics. I mean, they always questioned whether or not when we were doing certain things, either therapeutically or diagnostically, what was the evidence for that? Were we doing anything that didn't make sense or for which there was contradictory evidence? So they, they instilled in me that healthy skepticism. And, and so ever since then, um, I was always skeptical of, of, of certain therapies or whatever for which we didn't have uh, clear evidence. So this book has been percolating ever since medical school, which is to say for decades. But I, I, I owe this all to John Diaconis and Ted Woodruff, who I think I recognize in that, in that book at somewhere in the... Uh, in the epigraph or early, early in the book, I think I mentioned their names because they were, they were the cause of this. I blame the University of Maryland School of Medicine. You cover a lot of different topics in this book, and we want to go through at least a few of the chapters and allow you to lay out some of your arguments. So I guess to start with the first chapter about the use of antipyretics to treat fever, can you give an overview of fever and how antipyretics work? Right, so um, when you're infected or immunized, when you when you encounter a foreign antigen, um, you're, you're a foreign an invader, a parasite or a fungus or a bacteria or virus, your body wants to rid you of it. Um, it, it. It does that in a variety of ways, but one thing it does you you do is you increase your 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 core body temperature. Um, you do that by making a series of, of proteins called cytokines, which then travel to your hypothalamus and basically through the prostaglandin E2 system, increase your set point. And so you want to be warmer. So you dress more warmly. You put on socks. You put a log on the fire. You get under the covers. You shiver, uh, which increases your, your core body temperature. You want your temperature to be higher. We all do that. Everything that walks, crawls, swims, or flies on the face of this planet it can make fever. So why? I mean, we pay a metabolic price for it. It's not fun having fever. I mean, there's a lot of symptoms associated with fever like headache and body aches and chills and stuff. So why, why do we put ourselves through that? We do that because our immune system works better at a higher temperature. 
Neutrophils kill bacteria more efficiently at a higher temperature. Um, B cells make antibodies with more efficiently at a higher temperature. T helper cells help B cells make antibodies more efficiently at a higher temperature. Uh, cytotoxic T cells kill virus infected cells more efficiently at a higher temperature. And therefore, you can argue if that's true, then there should be abundant evidence that people who use antipyretics or anti-inflammatories during infections have prolonged or worsened illnesses. And there are probably 20 such studies that show exactly that. Nonetheless, we still feel compelled to treat fever. And it's, um, it's a mistake. We, we were really good with our kids who are now in their 20s and they survived childhood with us. Um, we never treated their fever because we, we, we saw fever for what it was, which is something that was helping them get better more quickly, as long as they could, could handle it. And they did. Um, we didn't treat fever. You mentioned there's a decrease in the effectiveness of the B T cell response in the NK helper cells. What evidence is there of the decrease in effectiveness of those cells with antipyretics? Well, well, both in vitro evidence, um, you know, uh, in, in the laboratory evidence, as well as in the book, I sort of focused most on the clinical evidence because I thought that was what people would be more interested in. I thought the laboratory evidence would be more boring, but um, clear evidence that, that um, you know, that what they, they looked at, I mean, study after study has looked at people, some of which were done at the University of Maryland, where they, you know, either treated or didn't treat, and Richard Hornig did those studies with, um, you know, with antipyretics and found that people were treated with antibiotics, although you feel better initially. And so you mistake mistakenly think, because I don't have fever, that means my illness is getting better. It doesn't mean that at all. You've cheated. And you've, you've really, at some level, uh, hurt your immune response by doing that. I mean, the, 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 I think I mentioned this case in, in the book, is it just happened all, not all that long ago. In fact, the father, I ran into him uh, yesterday on the, on the streets, but um, the father of this child. This was a 15-year-old boy who was a soccer player who, um, who was hit by a, a soccer ball on his hip. As a result, he developed a thrombus, a blood clot in a vein at his hip, which ultimately got infected. So now he has septic thrombophlebitis with MRSA, methicillin resistance to FRS. So we were treating him with vancomycin. Day after day, day after day, day after day, he continued to have bacteria in his bloodstream. The nurses were who have this as one of their mainstays, one of the four mainstays is thermoregulation in the nursing world. So they were treating him around the clock with Tylenol or ibu ibuprofen. And so finally, we, you know, we, we were just not getting on top of this infection. And we thought at the very least, let's not cripple this arm of the, the uh, effector arm of the immune system. So we sat down with the, the boy, sat down with his parents and, uh, and with the nurses and said, look, if he's willing to handle this fever, let's not treat it. And so for like, like about two days, we, we, you know, we didn't treat his fever. And then the bacteria in his bloodstream disappeared. Now, that may have happened anyway. I mean, it's not like we had any sort of control group, so we couldn't prove anything. But from the parents' standpoint, they thought we were brilliant because it, it certainly was a temporal association. And there's a physiologic explanation. So, One interesting thing I learned in your book was about a previous treatment for syphilis. Can you tell us about that? Right. So, so um in the days before we had antibiotics that specifically treated syphilis, uh, people used fever therapy for syphilis, for gonorrhea. And then it was done in one of two ways. Either you would get in, in a fever cabinet, which was like being sort of put in a cabinet and then turned on like bake um, and uh, to raise, to artificially raise your temperature. And that worked. Worked for syphilis, worked for gonorrhea. Another thing that was done, and this was a, this was a Nobel Prize winning observation, is they would inject people with malaria parasites, which would dramatically increase your temperature, 105, 106, 107 degrees, because you could do that in the in the early 1900s because quinine was an anti-malaria drug that had been available since the 1800s. So they would do that for a few days and then treat with quinine, um, and that too worked. To, as a treatment for syphilis. In fact, the, the, that injection of malaria parasites was done really up into the 1950s. It was much more recent than you would have thought. I'm going to assume that you're not going to recommend people inject malaria into patients in order to cure them of various illnesses, but is there any research into intentionally trying to increase body temperature to fight infections in patients? Well, when I was training, um, there was there was a, a medicine that could increase, I can't remember the name of it, that could increase your body temperature that was given occasionally for people who had, say, uh, disseminated gonococcal infection. I remember that. Um, so so I, it was at least alive during a period of time when uh, drugs to increase your body temperature were used. One of the studies that you mentioned is the Kluger study. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Right. It was a series of studies he did. I mean, he, what he did was... Um, Lizards are um, 
are, are not end, we're endotherms. We can make our own fever by, by resetting our, our hypothalamus and, and making a series of cytokines that do that. But lizards can't do that. So what they do, if they want to increase their temperature, they actually just like go to the top of a rock and sun themselves. And if they want to decrease it, they, you know, they go in the shade. They are exotherms. So, so he, he, he recognized that if you injected lizards with a particular bacteria, that you could cause them to die. Um, and then he, he, he basically manipulated their temperature to see whether temperature had an influence on the ability of these animals to rid themselves of this infection. And it clearly did. It was, uh, that was sort of the first proof that, um, you know, that, that, uh, that fever was beneficial. So are there any circumstances under which you would recommend using antipyretics to treat a fever? A few. I think if you have sort of chronic lung or chronic heart disease and you can't handle the metabolic stress that comes with fever, yes. And, and the other is pregnancy. Obviously, high fever can be deleterious to the unborn child. So that would be another reason to treat fever. In fact, the CDC regarding getting SARS-CoV-2 vaccines during pregnancy makes it very clear that if, you, if you're a pregnant woman and you get fever, you should treat it. Do you also recommend avoiding antipyretics for the treatment of pain? No, I think you should use it. I mean, pain has its own physiological negatives that can make it more difficult for you to recover. So sure, I think, you know, you just have to be careful when somebody's infected that when you treat, that when you, if you blunt their ability to make fever, that, that's, really, that's really the bigger issue. I can't help but underlining how your perspective on this topic very much goes against at least the the uh, the order sets that are typically in the hospital, like greater than thirty eight degrees Fahrenheit. Excuse me, Celsius. Greater than thirty eight degrees Fahrenheit would be a real problem. Greater than thirty eight degrees Celsius. Start them on acetaminophen. And I mean, up to date and Harrison's Manual of Medicine both say treating fever and its symptoms does no harm and does not slow the resolution of common viral and bacterial infections. So just to to make the argument in the strongest way possible, what would you say? to doctors that continue to use acetaminophen and other NSAIDs? Right, so it doesn't matter what I say. The only thing that matters is what the data show. The data have clearly shown over and over and over again that the use of antipyretics or, or anti-inflammatories to lessen fever during infections prolongs and worsen illnesses. I mean, there's study after study has shown that. I, I mean, people have been perfectly willing to have those studies come out the other way. They just never have. So you can make the definitive statements that, you know, this doesn't do this, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that study after study has shown that it does. I mean, Barton Schmidt, who I think is looked to by many pediatricians as um, kind of a guru in, in the practical care of children in issues like this, has clearly come around on this. I mean, he has now embraced the science that shows that treating fever um, is, is, is not only not beneficial, but can be harmful. And he's changed his recommendation. So the Barton Schmidt protocols have changed. I just think hospitals have been very slow to do this. And that's sort of the, generally the point in this book is that I think what works against uh, doctors here is just largely inertia and common belief, but it's always about the data, always about the science. It doesn't really matter what you believe. The only thing that matters is what's been shown to be true. What is the Barton Schmidt protocol? Yeah, so the, Dr. Schmidt, who's I think in Colorado, um, has a series of sort of recommendations for the practice for the practical practicing pediatrician about how to handle things like this fever in a child. Um, but the, the, the so-called Barton Schmidt protocols are at least as well known among pediatricians. So the next uh, chapter in your book deals with antibiotics. Where does the concept of an antibiotic course come from? From making it up. Largely, <laughs> I mean, you just pick a time and hope that it works. And if it works, you go, yeah, that's how long we need to treat. Um, but there are really few, very few studies looking at whether you can treat for shorter periods of time. And they're all interestingly based on multiples or five, five or seven as a general rule, right? Treat for one week, two weeks, three weeks. So it's not because bacteria reproduce themselves on the basis of the lunar month. They don't. So, you know, why not treat for, you know, eight days or, you know, three and a half days? Um, but but uh, or multiples of five because similarly bacteria don't replicate on the basis of the metric system. Um, so uh, you know now you're starting to see this now that we're moving taking our first steps into a post antibiotic era. You know where you'll see children who are admitted to the hospital who have diseases like cystic fibrosis where they're infected with a strain of bacteria that's resistant to all commercially available antibiotics. I mean you you know that when you see bacteriophages phages being inoculated into children 
and that's happening now, including in our hospital, that you've moved into the post-antibiotic era, that you're giving children viruses that kill specific bacteria because you don't have antibiotics to treat them anymore. Maybe you should be a little more judicious about your use of antibiotics. Um, bacteriophages were used, you know, 100 years ago right, before we had antibiotics. So we've gone from the sort of the pre-antibiotic era to now the post-antibiotic era, at least in some cases. And if you ever read St. Clair Lewis's book, Arrowsmith, which is the story of the physician Martin Arrowsmith, but that's what he did. He used, I mean, this was a book written in the 1920s. You know, the first real broad spectrum antibiotic, sulfonilamide, wasn't invented till the mid 1930s. So this is before that. And that's what they use, is bacteriophages. In this book written in 1920, now in the year 2020, we're doing the same things that were written in that book 100 years ago, a bad sign. So. You know, you, you need to be more judicious about the use. And one thing to do is to not treat as long. Um, certainly don't treat viral infections with, with antibiotics, which we certainly do far more than we need to, but, or should. Um, but, you know, you can treat for shorter periods of time. So now you're seeing those studies, studies where, you know, where, where bladder infections can be treated for a few days or kidney infections can be treated for a handful of days and not, I mean, I was trained, you treat a kidney infection for two weeks, um, even though now we know that that's not true or that you treat a bladder infection for seven to 10 days. Now you know you can treat shorter than that. So we're starting to, to finally do the kinds of studies that enable us to treat for shorter periods of time. And in fact, those studies have been embraced by the kinds of advisory groups that make recommendations on how long to treat. So that's all happened. The studies have been put in place. The advisory groups now agree with those studies. They've changed their, their, their advice and still people treat for longer than they need to. It's just really hard to get um, people to change their way of doing things. They, you know, they say, look, I do this and it works. And that's true, it does work, but you don't need to do it that long. I'm curious about the use of bacteriophages at your hospital. How often are they used? And is this, I won't call it commercial, but is this standard of care in your hospital or is this only research purposes? Yeah, we're learning. I mean, so so this the, most of the research is done out of Yale, and we do those studies in collaboration with Yale. So I think it's solely been in children who have cystic fibrosis, who've been you know treated for long periods of time with antibiotics to the point that they've um, developed resist completely resistant strains. So it's been in that setting. Most people have had the experience of going to the doctor and being given antibiotics. And then being told, make sure you finish the full five or seven or 10 day course. The reasoning being that if you don't finish it, it could lead to antibiotic resistance. Is that correct? What is your view of antibiotic stewardship? I think what happened is in the early days of antibiotics, when we didn't have enough, you know, the, the, when penicillin was first mass produced, we used to, you know, give a, a dose of doses of penicillin that were much, much less than we give today. So much because we didn't have enough available antibiotic, we would take people's urine where, you know, penicillin would be excreted and then purify the penicillin from the urine. I mean, that's how little antibiotic we had at the time. And so what would happen is people would be treated for a certain period of time, stop, and then there would be a, a relapse because you just didn't treat frankly, with enough uh, antibiotic. And so thus was born the notion that you needed to treat longer, whereas really what you needed to do was just give the right dose initially. Um, now we know that, that that notion that you're gonna be selecting for resistant bacteria if you don't treat for the whole course is wrong. In fact, the opposite is true, not surprisingly. The longer you treat with these broad spectrum antibiotics at a high dose, the more likely you are to select for resistance, which has been shown over and over again. And they, we, go, we go through those studies as well as reviews in, in the book. And so people are now starting to change uh, about that, but it's been slow in coming. Now, the notion that you don't need to finish your antibiotics is like you know, just this heretical notion. I mean, people can't believe that you could actually say that because people, doctors have been saying exactly the opposite of that for, for decades. So what should doctors be saying instead of taking the full dose? You should take until... Follow the advice of advisory bodies is what you should do. So you don't need to treat for that long. And now there's studies in pneumonia, for example, including you know complex bacterial pneumonias that get you into the ICU that you really only need to treat for two afebrile days, two days where the patient doesn't have fever anymore. And then you can stop. There was an excellent study showing do that as compared to, to let the doctor to do whatever they wanted to do, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, no difference in outcome. So, so you don't need to treat as long. And so we're, I can tell you in our hospital, we're much better at this. We, we now are much more likely to embrace that because we have a judicious use of antibiotics program headed by a great doctor named Jeff Gerber, and he has been, been on top of this. So we do treat for shorter periods. Brian Fisher's another doctor has been doing this. So we're, we're, we're much better at that. I'm proud of our hospital's ability to use antibiotics more judiciously. 
Another point you make in the book is about how often doctors end up prescribing antibiotics for viral infections. And it's not because doctors don't know that antibiotics won't work, but actually patients want antibiotics for their viral infections. Right. Uh, you know, you, you become like a, a waiter in a, in a restaurant. You know, it's like you just want to do what makes the patient happy, but that's not your job. I mean, your job is to make sure the patient is treated uh, appropriately and, and to help the parent, or in my case, pediatrics, help the parent through this dense thicket of medical information so that they can understand things. But that's not the way it works. I think because parents and patients evaluate doctors and lower evaluation rates are, you know, affect you, you know, people do what is expected of them. And it's, uh, it's hard to watch. I mean, you sort of seed your expertise. I mean, it's called shared decision-making, but you know, I, I mean, in theory, you're the doctor. I mean, you're the person who has the experience and expertise to make the decision. I mean, I would be frightened actually, if a doctor came in and said, look, here, here, here's, here's, uh, here's what I'm thinking about this, but I want you to, you know, you, you to weigh in on this. What the hell do I know? Any more than if my mechanic, you know, tells me if I'm trying to fix my car, what my opinion is. I don't have an informed opinion. You're the one with the informed opinion. What should I do? What are your thoughts on vitamin D? Yeah, the single most overrated vitamin out there. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's hard to pick up a JAMA or New, or New England Journal of Medicine these days to find, uh, to find that it doesn't contain an article showing that vitamin D doesn't do something that everybody's been saying it should be doing, whatever it is, whether it's making stronger bones, whether it's, it's uh, preventing fractures in, in older people, whether it's treating, treating or preventing cancers, whether it's treating or preventing heart disease. I just, uh, this is the world's most overrated vitamin. And I think it's, it's been, not to say you don't need vitamin D, you need vitamin D. And so the good news is you can make your own vitamin D actually by walking outside and being in the sun for 15 hours, for, sorry, for 15 minutes, at least twice a week. Um, and for some people, you know, their vitamin D is, is, uh, is, it can be a value, but not nearly the degree to which it's used. It, it's, it's a, it, you know, study after study after study shows that all these things that it's been claimed to do, it doesn't do. Um, it's, there's one particular advocate for this particular vitamin that I talk about in the book. We're not going to talk about it here, but you're welcome to read his name in that book. It, it's, it's somewhat interesting to me how much funding there seems to be behind vitamin D, because there are lots of things that you can't get funding for, and yet for everything like COVID, there were tons of studies initially on giving mega doses of vitamin D in ICU patients. So do you have any idea why there's so much funding behind the vitamin D lobby? I don't, I, we, we always look for the magic medicine. Somehow this has become the kind of universal magic medicine. I don't know, it is amazing. And it's, you know, it's technically, it's not a vitamin actually. It's uh, it, because usually vitamins you have to get from food. You can get vitamin D on your own by walking outside. Um, but uh, it's a hormone, but not really a vitamin. But, you know, the word vita, life, uh, vitamins always will have a, a good place in our heart, even though, you know, it, in this particular case, they're of absolutely no use, uh, like vitamin C for the common cold. I mean, how many studies have to be done to show that vitamin C does not treat or prevent the common cold? I think it's honestly, it's close to, to four dozen studies have been done. Doesn't matter. I mean, it's just people share this belief. It's like trying to say, it's, it's like trying to talk them out of a religious belief. It's, it's not going to happen. It's held with the strength of a religious conviction. So you're not going to change it. Data don't seem to change this story. On that note, can you tell us who Linus Pauling was? Right. So Linus Pauling was a brilliant man who was um, did seminal work on protein folding, things like, you know, the Alpha Helix, uh, for which he won the Nobel Prize when he was a young man in his 30s wins the Nobel Prize, ultimately goes on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, he won two Nobel Prizes. You know, they're not giving away these things in Cracker Jack boxes. That's not easy to do. And uh, and he, I think he's the only person ever to, wear, to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. Um, so a brilliant man who came to believe that, that vitamin C could not only treat or prevent colds, but could treat or prevent a variety of illnesses, including cancer. And, and when study after study showed that neither of those things were true, he untrue to form because he was a brilliant scientist, simply chose not to believe it. He, he, he got to that point in his life and maybe we all get there when we get old enough, so I shouldn't be too critical, but uh, he got to that point in his life where he just couldn't believe he was wrong. And he just continued to be an advocate for vitamin C, even for the treatment of cancer for which it doesn't work. And um, it was kind of 
sad. I mean, it, this, it's like, uh, it's Linus Pauling disease. Maybe it's Nobel Prize disease because um, others have suffered the same problem. So just to make sure that I understand your, your position on vitamin C and vitamin D with regards to COVID, because I know physicians who have prescribed and suggested patients take large doses of vitamin C and vitamin D. What does the data say about those two vitamins, or I guess in the case of vitamin D hormone, with regards to COVID treatment? They don't work. I mean, sorry. And a lot of things don't work for COVID-19. I mean, the trick, the trick with this virus is to prevent it. Okay. And you can prevent it by getting a vaccine. If you if you haven't gotten a vaccine, you know, you can also prevent it by masking and social distancing. That works too. Works just as well, if not better, than a vaccine, because you're in theory not even going to be going to be exposed to the virus. Um the, you know, remdesivir was disappointing. Uh, you know, initially it was sort of billed as saving four days of in-hospital stay, but more data came out. It really wasn't very good. I think dexamethasone is of value in, in, in people who have, you know, clearly a significant uh, uh, lung disease. Uh, but lopinavir and other antivirals not, doesn't look very good. You know, the monoclonals and convalescent plasma, I think, are a value if given very early in, in infection, which often isn't when people get it. Um, so, um you know, it's just uh, the, the goal with it's true with all viral infections, because there isn't the magic medicine for viral infections as there is for, for bacterial infections. I mean, antibiotics are a magic medicine for bacterial infections, but not for viral infections. Uh, they, they work. Antivirals work if given very early infection. But by the time you're in the hospital, it's too late. So prevent it. And how do you prevent it? Get a vaccine. And uh, vaccines are out there now. There is not a state in the union that does not have this vaccine available for people over 65. I think the latest data I saw was about 55% of seniors have gotten this vaccine. So still got a ways to go. We need to get people vaccinated. It's that simple. I mean, I was just, when I was on uh, Jake Tapper's show, there was, they asked me to prepare for a question about how the Texas Rangers had, uh, um, you know, like 40,000 people at their first game. And now have, and after that have sort of restricted the number of people. It's like, you know, they we're just going to have one super spreader event for fun. And then we're going to like go back to, you know, having 20 or 25% capacity where you're, you're distancing. But I don't get it. I really don't get the logic of that. So about two years ago, I sprained my ankle really badly and I taught, I went to see a couple doctors and a physical therapist and basically everyone told me that I should rice it. So I riced it, you know, for rest, ice, elevation, compression. What should I have done instead? And have I permanently damaged myself by following their advice? You probably haven't permanently damaged yourself. You're a young guy. But um, I think that the, the, the guy who came up with that, uh, that idea now has since retracted it as studies have shown that um, that's not a value. See, again, it's one of the, it's in many ways, it's analogous to fever because when you treat fever, you feel better. So you assume that you are better. When you ice a sprain, you feel better because you decrease blood flow to the area. So you, therefore you'll decrease pain. But you know, there's an increase of blood flow to the area for a reason. I mean, your body isn't trying to work against you here. It's working for you. So it's gonna bring those kind of nutrients and the things that will help for the repair of, of tendons and ligaments. Um, that that um, you, you need. And so when you ice it and you decrease blood flow to the area, then you then prolong healing. And again, the, the several studies, there's not a lot of studies, but several studies have shown that you clearly, clearly prolong healing by doing that. And slowly now people are starting to get that, that you, uh, if anything, should treat it with warmth, not, uh, not cold. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about cancer. Uh, you talk about two forms of cancer in your book, uh, primarily thyroid cancer and breast cancer. Before we start talking about those two types of cancers individually, can you give your barn analogy for cancer? Right. So, so there's sort of three types of cancers uh, and with this barnyard analogy. It's not mine. It's actually Gilbert Welch came up with this analogy. He's a sort of cancer epidemiologist. But um, so, so you open a barn door, there's three animals there. Um, there's the the bird that immediately flies out. And so that's that sort of analogy. It doesn't matter. You can't, you can't close the barn fast enough. That's a cancer that is going to kill you no matter what you do. In terms of chemotherapy or radiation or surgery, you're going to die from that cancer. Then there's the, the turtle, which is so slow that, that you have plenty of time to close the door. This is a cancer that you're likely to die with and not from. 
And then there's the rabbit. The rabbit is, you see the rabbit starting to run towards you. You can close the door in time to keep the rabbit from running up. That's a, a, a cancer where treatment will make a difference. So that's the key for, for cancer treatments. Are you dealing with rabbits, birds, or turtles? And for some cancers, you're dealing with an abundance of, of, of turtles, which I would argue is prostate cancer. And for some, you're dealing with an abundance of rabbits, you know, which would be, say, you know, disseminate, disseminated prostate cancer, or pancreatic cancer, where there's really very little you can do. So the trick is figuring that out, which of those are there. And so, so, and so the, then the issues become one of screening testing with, you know, with thyroid cancer. Those are the kinds of cancer most people die uh, with and not from. You can die from it, but if you're going to die from it, you're going to die from it anyway. Uh, there's really not much you can do. So there's a lot of unnecessary thyroidectomies. And then the same thing with prostate cancer. We just don't have a good screening test for these. What you need is you need a screening test that includes either biological or genetic markers or both that says, this is a cancer that's going to kill you, or this is a cancer that you're going to die with. Because you know when you do autopsies, for example, of men who are in their 80s or 90s, most of them have prostate cancer, uh, but those are cancers they died with and not from. So there's, again, a lot of unnecessary prostate surgery. So I try and go through breast cancer, prostate cancer, thyroid cancer to kind of help the, the reader um, understand how, how to at least ask better questions. I mean, I'm not saying to people they should be their own doctors. Uh, you probably shouldn't. I've been my own doctor a few times and it's been disastrous, so, I, so don't follow my advice. My, but at least you can ask better questions when you Read, uh, read this. And I think that's the goal of all this, just to be able to be more informed, be a better, better educated consumer of healthcare. What are the questions that people getting either thyroid cancer screenings or mammograms should be asking their doctor? Right. To do in this, in this, in this thing where you've just told me that I have, um, uh, let's say my mammogram is, un, is unusual. What is the value? Show me the data. That, that say that, for example, um, uh, either breast removal or radiation therapy, show me the data that says that what I have here means that I am less likely to die if I do what you're asking me to do. Because there are plenty of studies out there showing that, that, that often um, too much is done for all three of those cancers. So, so convince me that I need to go through this. And there, there was one woman who I talk about in this book a little bit um, who did that, who really you know, went through the, the odds and looked through all that and realized that she... Um, that it, she should ignore some of the things she was told not to ignore. But um, again, it just, it just gives you a better idea. See, we're so scared the minute you hear the word cancer uh, that, uh, that you want it out of you and, and you're willing to do whatever you have to do to get it out of you. But you know, some of these things just aren't what you would, to, to me, the word cancer means if you don't treat it, you're gonna die from it. And, and there are many cancers out there that that's not true. So we shouldn't call them cancer. I mean, papillary carcinoma of the thyroid is not something you're going to die from. It's something you're going to die with. So we shouldn't call it carcinoma. Do you have a name recommendation? <laughs> uh, un, 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 unfortunate growth. I don't know. Just some, <laughs> something else. I think pathologists will like that, unfortunate growth. <laughs> Can you walk us through the risks of overdiagnosis as it relates to false positives or complications? Sure. The, the, I mean, not all tests obviously are, 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 there's always going to be false positives in tests. I Meaning you think that you're diagnosed with a cancer that you really don't have. Um, the PSA test is, is an example. It's just, it was never designed really to be a screening tool for, for cancer. The person who, who invented this, Richard Avalon, has come out and said, this is not how, what I meant for this. this is not what this was for. Um, but it doesn't matter. So, you, you know, so now you're scared because you've gotten a positive test and, and, you know, it's emotionally burdensome. It sometimes can be financially burdensome and it's, we're just not there yet. We're not there yet on certain cancers. I mean, mammography is of some value. It is, but there are certain situations where it's not a value and you have to sort of try and figure out what, where those are. I go through those in some detail in the book. I'm not gonna go through it here, but I think, you know, that, that you can educate yourself, I think, by figuring out in which situations you're more or less likely to be harmed. We're, I, th I have to believe in your medical lifetime, we're gonna have much better tools to figure out either genetically or biochemically, what are the cancers you really should worry about? Because we're not there now. And we do a lot of harm with some of these cancers that aren't cancers. One of the questions that I had while reading your book it's just like many of these things we've known about for a long time, or at least the data have been fairly clear for a long time, but either the guidelines haven't changed or just doctors 
haven't changed their practice. And I'm wondering if you can speak to what the reasons are that these practices still persist. Well, I think the biggest is inertia, that people have been doing it a certain way, they're used to doing it that way, and they want to continue with doing it that way because for them it works, even though they could do less and it would still work. The second is that, that they aren't educated about this, that they, they, you know, doctors only have so much time, they can't read all things all the time, and they may not be up to date on some of those data, especially regarding, say, antibiotic treatment courses, et cetera. And then the more, the more nefarious reason would be that there's a financial incentive to do something. So for example, putting in heart stents is a very lucrative thing to do, even though we now know that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't in any sense prolong your life. And, and now there are groups like the Cleveland Clinic, which now don't do those sorts of things. But um, I would say of all the hate mail that I got related to, to this book, um, most of it's centered on the uh, well, some of it centered on the vitamin C because I was attacking a religion, as was vitamin D. But it was from uh, you know cardiologists or cardiovascular surgeons that wanted to that didn't like the heart stent chapter because that sort of threatens their livelihood. But just to clarify on that point, you're saying there's no evidence that stents specifically for the treatment of angina prolong life, or in no circumstance does a heart stent prolong life. For the most part, in no circumstances, it seemed to pro- I mean, for an emergency where it's a critical blockage of that large artery, sure. I think then you saved the life. But the problem is, see, people think, it sort of makes sense, right? You, you have a heart attack or you have angina. And, and, and the, the muscle that, it, that it, where that has occurred is distal from, where the, from an artery that was, say, more than 70% blocked. It all makes sense then to, 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 uh, to dilate that, article with, with, or that uh, artery with a stent open up that article, then, then would not put you at greater risk. The problem is the smaller arteries that follow from that, that, that are derived from that, are also blocked. So, so it doesn't matter whether you open up the big artery or not in the long run. And that's why those studies show that you don't prolong life. And for angina, it doesn't prolong life. And it doesn't even um, make a difference in terms of your perception of pain. And, you know, to do those studies, to, to show that it really didn't make a difference in your perception of pain, they had to do sham st- stenting you know, which means that you pretend you're putting in a stent. I think that was done in England. And uh, it, it's, uh, I'm sure there was a fight to get through the Institutional Review Board to do a sham stenting procedure. But that, those studies were a proof that, that if you didn't know whether you got a real stent or not, um, that's the only way to be able to tell whether or not fairly you were suffering more or less pain because pain is subjective. There's not that thing that measures pain. I can't imagine trying to get something like that through an IRB here. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> Give him credit. Dr. Offa, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to chat with us. For anyone that's interested in learning more about your work or Overkill, where can they find out information about those? Yes, yeah, I'm supposed to know this. My, my wife actually set up a website and I never remember the name of it. I think it's like <laughs> all offitcom It's not hard to find. But, um, and that goes through sort of the books that I've written about the uh, these medical narratives that go through some of these uh, these things. I have another book coming out in um, September with uh, with uh, Basic Books, which is part of the Percy's Publishing Group. It's called "You Bet Your Life: um, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccinations: The Long, Risky History of Medical Innovations." Basically, which just goes to show, sort of goes through the price paid for knowledge. Can you give us a little uh, teaser on on what we can expect to read in that book? Right. So it goes through every major medical advance to show just how painful it was to learn what we learned. Everyone. I mean, I'll give you just the one that that continues to upset me as a child of the 50s. And it comes up now when we talk about doing placebo controlled trials. When Jonas Salk invented his polio vaccine, he didn't want to do a placebo controlled trial. He felt that in his studies in Pittsburgh, in and around Pittsburgh, that the vaccine was safe, the, the whole killed polio vaccine was safe, that it induced an immune response, which he felt was likely to be protective. Nonetheless, that trial was that 420,000 children were given a vaccine in this country, um, 200,000 received placebo, 1.2 million children served as observed on inoculated controls. And when it was found to work a year later, church bells rang out, synagogues held special prayer meetings. I mean, the Voice of America told the world that we had invented a safe, effective, potent uh, polio vaccine. Well, how do we know it was effective? We knew it was effective because 16 children in that study died of polio, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 34 children were permanently paralyzed in that study. 34 of the 36 children who were paralyzed were in the placebo group. That's how we knew that. That's how we know. 
And I think that study broke Jonas Salk's heart. He, he didn't want to do that study. He, he, he felt that it was an unnecessary sacrifice. I mean, those, this was 1950s. I was born in 1951. These children would be my age now. And um, such is the price paid for knowledge. And I just think we, we always have to be aware of that. You can see that now with the COVID studies. I mean, even in children. I mean, we just did, Pfizer just did a 2200 study, a child study in 12 to 12 to 16 year olds, you, you probably 12 to 15 year olds. You probably just came out a few days ago. There were 18 cases of disease. So 1,100 got vaccine, 1,100 got placebo. There were 18 cases of disease all in the placebo group. Well, that's 18 kids who got sick. That's how we know. That's how we know it worked. Mm. It's just something to think about. Definitely. If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends.